very interesting subject this morning, and one that is not often discussed because <clears throat> the reliable information that people like to have is simply not available. Therefore, we must think in terms of generalities, but we also have an interesting equation here because the situation with which we are originally involved has descended to us and been re-stamped in our present generation. In other words, most of the material dealing with the mysticism of Dante has come back into focus in the last 20 years. But to go back to the beginning of the subject, which is quite a fascinating one, we have to go back to the Crusades. And the Crusades, as you all know, uh, were tragedies and disasters. The desperate effort to rescue the Holy Sepulchre from the hands of the infidel failed miserably. And uh, wave after wave of European knighthood, the very cream of uh, the aristocracy, the cultured, the educated people of their time, were involved in this hopeless expedition into the desert, and most of them left their bones there. In the meantime, at home, there was a strange change taking place due largely to the tragedy of the Crusades. Practically every important leader of European culture was somewhere in the Holy Land. Kings, princes, dukes, uh, scholars, professors, priests, clergies, popes, all of these different levels were involved directly in the great effort to rescue the Holy Sepulchre. Perhaps the most pathetic of all of the great crusades was the Child's Crusade, in which thousands of children died in the sands of the Near East if they got that far. So it was a very pathetic period, and in this time, uh, Europe was deprived a very large part of its male leadership. Nearly everyone who was strong enough to bear arms was in the great crusades. And the entire internal life of many countries suddenly descended upon women. They were the ones who had to carry on. They not only had to carry on their private family lives, but they had to carry on the management of the state. They had to carry on the p churches, the cathedrals, the palaces. They had to go on with all of the complications, the conspiracies of the time. They were suddenly forced to become the leaders of their domestic culture. For the most part, I think we can say they did an excellent job of it. But the most important of their contributions was that, as women, they were not much interested in war, except in a very unpleasant way. They were not interested in most of the ploys of power that we have become familiar with. They were much more interested in the arts. They were culture conscious. They had a deeper religious insight. They were more given uh, to contemplative considerations. They preferred to uh, fulfill the duties of motherhood. They were the mothers of kings and the mothers of princes. But most of all, as women, they were not basically militant. And their uh, feelings were much emphasized by the fact that many of them, maybe most of them, lost the men in their family in the Crusades. So suddenly Europe was dominated by a powerful feminist culture. This culture, as Lord Clark points out, began to show itself in arts, in music, in drama, and largely in religion. The new emphasis, therefore, was not upon power, but upon the gentler emotions. Not so much upon conspiracies and invasions and battlements, but upon making a warmer environment for home. These women, whether it's in palace or cottage, were home builders. Gradually, the battlements of the, of the castles were 
planted with flowers. Tapestries were added to the walls. Beautiful paintings appeared. And uh, the cultures and graces were exemplified. Courtesies became more uh, obvious. And the entire emotional life of the people received a very powerful impulse toward refinement. In this time, we have a great record of the arts of the period. We know that it was in this time that most of the great Christian art of Europe began to appear. It was at this time also that the cult of the Virgin Mary began to take a very definite form. In earlier times, it was passed over rather lightly. Uh, it was venerated but not emphasized. And all of a sudden, the cult of the Virgin came to be ex uh, emphasized, to be considered as identical in motive, in ideal, and in conviction with the new spirit of gentility that was arising in the land. Also, we find quite a change in the artistry of religious, sac uh, religious painting. The Madonnas began to look very motherly. They looked kindly. They were gentle and beautiful people. Whereas previously in the Gothic forms, they were often very crude and firm and rather adamantine in their uh, appearance. So the cult of the Virgin came into strong emphasis. Now this was not completely new. It had happened before. Although many people deny that there is any trace of it. The truth of the matter is that the worship of feminine deities goes back to the very beginning of time. The supreme deity, as far as public veneration uh, was concerned in Egypt, was Isis, the mother of mysteries. In Greece, we have a whole group of feminine divinities, perhaps the most important of which was Athena, who was not only the goddess of women, but the goddess of war, the goddess of literature, of learning, and of arts and crafts. In Chaldea, Astarte, and in uh, many other areas, the worship of the feminine principle was already well established. In Europe, however, it had not become dominant until women themselves began to cultivate the characteristics and qualities of feminine nature. Uh, women became far more refined. They had more time on their hands with the um, local conditions held in suspension by the Crusades abroad. Embroidery, artistry, the education of their children came closer and closer to their lives. Their children were not educated as they had been by um, professional warriors. They were educated by their mothers, their aunts, their grandmothers, and by governesses. The whole change in cultural life in Europe began with the, the Crusades and the consequence of this particular circumstance. Now, of course, all the men did not perish en route, and some of the older and the younger never got to the Crusades. But this uh, pr principle of gentility, this new refinement, reached into practically every phase of life. And about this time, there arose in Europe, particularly in Italy and Provence, uh, province of France, uh, the, the troubadours. Now, the troubadours we consider now to have been simply professional musicians. We know that they did go from castle to castle and from court to court, playing their melodies and reciting their heroic hymns and, and odes. Of course, among the troubadours were the ones who carried forward the great mythology of the Grail Cycle, the great mysteries of King Arthur and his court, Charlemagne and his paladins, and all of the European legendary. But the uh, troubadours came from a word trouvier, meaning a priest. They were not simply secular musicians. They were actually banded together in a kind of mystic fraternity, which was very tightly tied in to the new situation that was developing in the social life of Europe. These troubadours became, therefore, the singers of romantic songs. 
the singers of love songs, the singers of the gallantries of the knights and the courtiers in the treatment of women. They were also much concerned with the famous rescue of women from tyrants and ogres, and the troubadours created and spearheaded the Age of Chivalry, in which uh, knighthood was dedicated largely to the protection of the weak, to the liberation of those who were unjustly persecuted. And the uh, knight errantry was almost a sacred art. And in this, these days, a young man, when he was knighted uh, by uh, his overlord or on the field of battle, retired into a church or cathedral, and there did vigil and prayed night after night that he might dedicate his arms and his life to the service of good, of truth, and of the helping of the afflicted. So that knighthood gradually also changed its focal point. Instead of going out to fight on the fields of battle, the knight became a champion of persecuted causes. He became a defender of the faith, the defender of the, ch of the faithful, the protector of the widow and the fatherless. He was a dedicated person whose sword and his heart were dedicated to the service of those in need. Now, the knighthood and chivalry organizations also mingled with the troubadours. And the troubadours, together with these other organizations, created a very interesting situation, based undoubtedly, originally, upon disillusionment. The uh, trouviers, the troubadours, were dedicated to what were called the courts of love. And these institutions uh, are represented in ancient emblemism largely by a walled enclosure in the center of which grew a flowering rose. Now this rose later became involved with the Rosicrucians. It became the rose of the house of Tudor. It became the rose of Martin Luther. The rose became the symbol of love as it was simply an acrostic by arranging the letters differently, R-O-S-E became E-R-O-S, the word meaning love. So this particular situation, the courts of love, had a very interesting background. And I think the way to approach it is the way Dante approached it in his strange, mystical, psychic piece of poetry or example of work, The New Life. Here we have a key to something. The women who were meditating upon the state of Europe as it was handed to them when their men left realized that the whole social structure was wrong. Furthermore, they realized that there had to be a change and a great many, in fact most men, agreed with them. Because, after all, there's no particular pleasure in going out and rotting in the fields of Palestine. It was far better to be home doing things that were constructive or interesting. So what happened was this. It became obvious to these people, symbolically, that the mind was associated distinctly and definitely with the male principle, and the heart with the feminine principle. And the whole point of the time was the gradual transference of leadership from the mind to the heart. The basic argument was almost irrefutable. All the conspiracies of state, all the selfishness, all the ambitions, all the corruptions seemingly arose from bad thinking. The mind became a kind of tyrant. The mind became a destroyer of life. It invented one device after another to kill people. The mind was a separating force. It was a force that was constantly seeking self-aggrandizement. It was selfish, self-centered, and ambitious for pos possession and estate. It wanted wealth and power and would commit all kinds of crimes, including murder, to gain an office that it wanted. It was the mind that planned the stratagems of state, 
And in the days of the Medici's and the Borgias, the stratagems of state were not particularly uh, ethical. Everything was based upon getting power, using power, and abusing power. This gradually dawned on the minds of those who had passed through the terror of the Crusades, which was one of the most terrible episodes in world history. And scarcely had the Crusades been assuaged when came the next great enemy, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, which for over 300 years ravished Europe. And it is said that before it was over, it had taken in death two-thirds of the population of Europe, men, woman, and child. Here was another great disaster, and the mind was unable to cope with it. The high professors of Avenon could do nothing in their universities to solve the mystery of the plague. They tried everything they could think of, from pleading to God to selling their soul to the devil, but the plague continued, because they did not have the realization or the knowledge or the skill to realize that it was carried by rats. But the plague devastated the people left from the great crusade patterns, and Europe was in a terrible misery. It was in a desperate situation. And life became comparatively meaningless. The, uh, even the most powerful were not assured of a single extra day of life. To meet this problem then, it became evident that something had to be done to change the basic attitudes of human beings. And the uh, circumstances were propitious. The circumstances were made more obvious and set up as better examples by the leadership of women in the period following the Crusades. During this time, they gained ascendancy, and wherever they did gain ascendancy, things were better. They were very successful in maintaining concord rather than sacrificing life and liberty to discord. The, the troubadours, taking this motive, and followed by many other groups, all the great poets of the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries, shared these convictions. Later, Goethe gives us the line, the eternal feminine leads us on. And this was what happened in Europe. The eternal feminine became personified in the Virgin Mary. And the uh, worship of the heart or love principle began to gain ascendancy. It was decided as important to shift rulership of the personal life from the mind to the heart. Well, the consequence of this effort resulted in a whole group of symbolic institutions and greatly strengthened mysticism in Christianity. Mysticism became the approach by means of love, the courts of love, the love of God, the love of man, the love of nature, the love of truth and of beauty. We come all the way back to Plotinus in his essay on the beautiful. This same spirit moved in Alexandria in the first century A.D. It is found in practically all ancient civilizations, but never brought to the same degree of focus as it reached in Europe. So the uh, whole center of gravity, we will say, the hub upon which civilization was to turn, was taken from the rulership of the mind and bestowed upon the rulership of the heart. The heart, therefore, became not only the ruler of life, but the ruler of the mind. It was no longer subject to the mind, but the mind was under the censorship of the heart. And of course there was ample religious foundation for this point of view because it fitted perfectly with the, with the Sermon on the Mount, with the teachings of Christ, and with most of the mysticisms of the early church in their formative days. The whole idea of softness, 
of forgiveness, of charity, of unselfishness. All this was summarized in the cult of the Virgin and also became the leading, we won't say fad, but the possessing fantasy of the time. It took over as a tremendous moral force. Now, in the development of this concept, there were certainly secret societies set up in Europe. Among these secret societies, probably the most important was the troubadours. And these included not only Dante and their membership, but also many other great poet mystics of their time. There's even reason to believe that the remnants of the troubadours survived in England and on the continent as late as the 17th or early 18th century. The uh, Pleiad, the great uh, constellation of poets under Ronsard, was part of the troubadours. They were the poets of great verse. They were the writers of the sonnets. And, of course, the amatory note of such sonnets as those of Shakespeare are all symbolical relating to the mysterious damosel of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The, the, the damosel was the heart, the soul, the secret love. It was that part of man's nature to which all the rest sacrificed itself. And the idea of the Virgin Mary gradually came to be bestowed upon the feminine sect completely. All women became personifications of the Virgin Mary and were so treated as symbolical respect for the Mother of Christ. Now this uh, we find clearly set forth in Dante's work in which he also gives another in interesting uh, and very uh, significant uh, modification of the concept. Dante's Beatrice was, of course, undoubtedly the symbol of his own heart and the soul which is within us and which is, more or less, the immediate vehicle of the heart. The soul is seated in the heart. The heart manifests through the soul. And the body is actually a kind of vehicle through which religion ethics, culture, idealism, and integrity can express themselves. So to Dante and to the troubadours there came another interesting t twist in the belief, namely that the secret love must be something that no one knew anything about. The individual had to have a mysterious demoiselle whom he never discussed with anyone and whom he never met. It was not a case of the refinement of personal relationships alone. It was the idea that the troubadour worshipped the feminine principle as the unknown woman. The woman whom he never met, Dante is said never to have seen uh, Beatrice except on one or two occasions at a distance. He never spoke to her. He knew nothing about her personally. He was not aware of her death until he learned of it. But through his entire uh, life, she was the blessed, mysterious woman within himself to whom he gave a complete allegiance, whose service he was dedicated to, who he would never perform a deed which would cast a reflection upon her. But he never met her. And this was part of the uh, whole philosophy of the courts of love. They were not simply a refinement of physical relationships. They were a transcendency over them. And it has been sus suspected, and probably rightly, that St. Francis de Assis was a troubadour. They were the worshippers of the invisible woman, the mistress of life. And they created around her a code of fraternity and friendship to compete with and overwhelm uh, the uh, code of the mind with its forever destroying, its ever corrupting, its ever compromising. 
Now, there's no question in the world that this particular point of view did have an effect upon human relationships. It ennobled them considerably over previous conditions. And it brought a new respect, a new uh, honor, and a new regard for the chastity of marriage and for all of the domestic relationships of life. But all of these were extensions and symbols based upon an immaculate relationship with life. It, uh, the point now, I think, comes down into our present day with a certain amount of real significance. The great crusades were a tragedy in history. They resulted in the rise of this strange and very beautiful belief. The collapse of the Egyptian empire led to the rise of Egyptian mysticism. The falling of Greece brought with it the revival of Greek mysticism. The collapse of Rome made way for the rise of Christian mysticism. In the Far East it is the same. While in India we have the male divinities, we also have forever the feminine divinities who will become the symbols of human improvement. And of course, most of all, in Buddhism we have Kannan, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. The principal belief of these people is compassion. And the embodiment of compassion began as a male divinity, Avalokitesvara. But in a very short time, compassion was feminized. And throughout all of Asia, the Kannan, or feminine aspect, is the one that has received the love, the devotion, attention, consideration, and worship of hundreds of millions of people. Therefore, the feminine principle truly leads us on. We are just passing through a great period of international world maladjustment. We are coming to a kind of situation which is not so different from the Crusades. We are not trying to rescue something from somewhere, but we are trying to save everything from the various adverse forces that operate upon it. We are working to protect our way of life. We are working to protect our governments, our nations, our industries. We are working to protect employment. We are working to find answers to the pressing problems of the day. And we have sat back and waited. And we have heard and listened to all kinds of remedies. There is scarcely a time you can turn on your television in which somebody does not make learned remarks about something. But after we have heard them all, we still uh, find no answers. Everything is in terms and technologies. Everything is to try to bolster a way that has failed, and a way that we do not wish to admit has failed. We do not wish to admit the two world wars, a great depression, and incredible inflation in the present century means something more than a passing incident or a group of incidents. In other words, we're getting very close to the point that they were in at the time of the Crusades, when it became evident to the mystics and the troubadours and the mystics in the church that the time had come to shift leadership from the mind to the heart, that only in this way is there any hope of creating an integrity. The mind simply is incapable of placing the kindliness that is necessary, the sympathy, the understanding that we need. These are virtues of the heart. True friendship cannot be accomplished by treaties or legislations, but only by a fraternity arising within the emotional integrity of persons. We cannot bring peace out of the present chaos until we find some way to give love authority over conduct. The old mystics in the church were very certain of this. 
and in the symbols of alchemy and the symbols of the Kabbalah and everything. These principles are clearly set forth that the answer to the question is not to be found in skill alone, because skill is a tyrant unless love guides it. There is nothing that we need today that is not obtainable or attainable if our emotional integrity requires it. If we are willing to sacrifice for the common good, it is because we have affection for the common good. If we are willing to put the well-being of another person above our own, this is because we love either that other person or we love the truth or the principles upon which conduct is based. The only solution for the broken home is true love. The only solution to the wayward children is true love. Love that is not contaminated by the ulterior motives of the mind, which has always been, as the Bhagavad Gita tells us, the slayer of the real. On the Crusades it slayed millions in the deserts of Arabia and Palestine. In two world wars it has slain millions. In the Great Depression it is threatening the survival of nation after nation, even today, because there is no essential reverence for or veneration for the human being as a creature. We are not concerned sufficiently with the good of others that we will take the position that was taken by the troubadours in the effort to solve this problem. One thing that Dante points out in his whole uh, Vita Nueva is, is key to it is that in the adoration of the blessed Demoiselle, it, there is no requirement for compensation or recompense of any kind. It is too much to ask that she will even smile. It is love given because of love, and it is not dependent upon reward of any kind. It does not follow that if we love another person, they must love us. St. Francis makes this point very clear, that they, there is no demand. Love demands nothing and gives all. And in giving all and demanding nothing, it gains all. In the relation of nations, if love becomes a vital factor, we are not out to benefit from treaties. We are not out to juggle with profits. We are not willing or interested in asking favors for favors granted. These are the ulterior motives that have defeated us since the dawn of time. And these are the motives that are so clearly brought to our attention in Dante's book. Here we have the true way in which love operates. It operates without any hope or desire for reward. This was the reason why, for most, in most instances, uh, the, the woman in Dante's visions is not a human being. And if it is happening to be a human being, and if any troubadour found a lady of his affection, still the principal was not a person. The person might be honored, and the principal might be transferred to a person under some conditions. But not the, the person was not the, the reality of it. The reality of it was that there was something somewhere that was so beautiful, so wonderful, so pure, so filled with understanding and insight that it became the one being, the one person, the one thing in the whole world that understood us. And for this person, the individual dedicated all of himself, asking nothing but the right to worship asking no favor, sending out no prayer for recompense, but simply offering self completely in homage to this divinely significant person. 
And uh, in most instances, the person, if it was a real person, lived and died and never knew of this strange, mysterious love of the troubadour, because he never revealed it and never did anything to compromise her or himself. It was simply that in his life, this person to whom he felt it and mysterious attachment had become the object of the perfection of his own nature. As we read carefully through the lines of this, we begin to realize that this person is also the human soul. The human soul is that part of us which we have never seen, for which we can give no name, but upon which we have bestowed an innumerable number of names. The soul is that part of the individual which is the savior of the life. And in most of the mystical systems of antiquity, the soul or the anima becomes the blessed demoiselle. It also, in a larger sense, is the anima or activating soul of Christianity. It is this soul power which is the invisible beauty, the eternal feminine, the power that is built up and has always been resembled, represented in feminine form. This uh, soul, then, becomes the heroine of the story, and life is nothing but a dedication to the perfection of the soul. It means that the individual must give up every action, every thought, every attitude which conflicts with the integrity of his own soul. His own soul demands and accepts nothing except good. The, the soul is without any ulterior motive. The soul is without any pretense. And the soul offers no reward actually to the person except the realization that it is the proper thing. The uh, service of the soul, as Dante points out, therefore is not an exceptional thing. It is not an heroic thing. It is not something for which we should be forever compensated. It is not something that justifies our belief that we are on our way to a heavenly state. It is simply the fact that obedience to the soul, the elevation of the labors of the soul above the mind and above the body, is natural. It is the normal course, and anything else is abnormal or subnormal. The individual who is right is normal. And, to, and a, it is a mistake to say that normal means to share in the common delinquencies. We may say that persons with various degrees of sharing with their own mistakes belong to an average. The average person does one thing or does another thing. But average and normal are not synonyms. The average may be comparatively low, but the normal is higher than the average person has ever been able to reach. So the normal becomes the perfect acceptance of the pure love of the soul and the bestowal of all love upon the soul and its labors and all outside persons and objects that are desirable, that are worthy of our affection and worthy of our service and worthy of our sacrifice are in some way aspects of our own soul power. The soul, therefore, is the mistress of life. It is the power by means of which we do all things well, whereas for the most part up to the present we have been doing them rather badly. In this point, then, Dante is very clear in his understanding. When you read his book, you also discover another phase of this question, and that is uh, the forlorn aspect. Dante is forever forlorn. He is forever defeated. He is forever weeping. He is forever sorrowing because he has not been able to be worthy of his beloved. Some of this goes all the way back to the Song of Solomon in the Bible. The uh, point, of course, in, in uh, Dante's story is this sense of his own imperfection 
No matter what he does is not good enough. No matter how he serves, he is not worthy of this ineffable beauty and ineffable goodness that he recognizes as his mistress. He is delinquent in many things. He is unable, for example, to attain a, comf a peace within himself that is sufficient to carry him through his longings and his hopes and his seekings after the invisible. He is therefore always so more or less frustrated. He is forever the prodigal son. He is forever the one who has to find his way back in some manner to the heavenly regions from which he came. He lives, therefore, in a state of constant emotional sorrow. Uh, of course, Dante was a poet, and he was a poet with an extremely complicated nature. We know, for instance, that in the Divine Comedy, he is not only a great poet, but a cynic. He is a cynic and a skeptic. In the uh, Divine Comedy, he caricatures his personal enemies, and he places in the lowest regions of perdition those persons whom he personally dislikes. He also was able to caricature many of the leaders of his time, uh, which did not endear him to them, but fortunately he was able to escape from the normal retribution by, being, by becoming an exile. Also, he was a strangely emotional man. He had a strange intensity of sentiment. He was a, an unbridled uh, sentimentalist. of sentiment. He was a, an unbridled uh, sentimentalist, and also was subject to visions, mysterious inner experiences, dreams, and archetypal visions and strange phenomena of sleep and waking. On one occasion in his life, uh, he was walking along the roadside and saw a beautiful rose growing. This was while he was in exile. He went over and looked at the rose and burst into tears and fell at, its, at the base of the rose bush. He was completely overcome by the beauty of the flower. Something tremendously sentimental within himself uh, had developed over the years and was very definitely uh, involved in his book on the new life. But what he was trying to tell us, I think in the book primarily, is that there is a new life that there is an old way of going along, being selfish, being self-centered, getting all you can and giving as little as possible, and then drifting into the unknown eternity that lies ahead. This was the old way of life, and for many people it is still the way of life, and will be for a long time to come. But these people have no dedication, and to Dante, dedication, even if it was tearful, was far more important than indifference to values. The individual who suffered for his uh, convictions was really a happier person than an individual who rejoiced in his delinquencies. The actual, having, the, the living of a principle makes all things right. In this principle there may be tears, there may be hours of sorrow, there may be losses, Life will not run along perfectly smooth for a person who feels deeply or who takes a very sincere and dedicated interest in life. The more serious we become, the more we can be hurt. Uh, the more dedicated we become, the more we can suffer from the insults and thoughtlessness and cruelty of other people. We are very, very sensitive. But the sensitivity which it permits us to suffer is also the sensitivity that brings with it the internal enlightenment. Unless the person is sensitive, the overtones do not come through. But the person who is sensitive and is able to register the overtones is also hurt 
uh, by the profaneness of mortal existence. So this is part of a mystical type of life. It has been true of mystics since the beginning that they have paid for their insight by having an understanding or realization of values that brings with it a certain amount of pain, a certain amount of, uh, of disappointment, and uh, in many instances, many flowings of tears and grief. But it is all worthwhile, because without this, there is no way of bringing about the, the regaining of paradise. In the Divine Comedy, Beatrice, who is the symbol of the soul, the eternal feminine, and an embodiment of the Virgin Mary, Beatrice becomes his guide in Paradiso. As he has wandered through the underworld with Virgil, he comes finally to the better world, and here he is led by Beatrice through the various regions that lead ultimately uh, to the supreme heavenly abode. Therefore, as the soul, of course, Beatrice becomes the leader of the redeemed, becomes this power which leads the individual in the afterlife because he has attained the power of it in the present life. If he lives in this world according to the power of his own soul, he can face the future without fear, for the soul he has fashioned here will serve him hereafter. The soul, then, is the primary factor in the situation, and, of course, is also the primary objective of the alchemist, was the creation and integration of the power of the soul as the universal medicine for the corruptions of the flesh. The Greeks had their own understanding of soul. Modern psychologists have theirs also. But I think the real answer lies in the fact that the soul is something that not, is not fashioned primarily at a particular moment in life. I rather like to feel with certain of the classical thinkers uh, that the soul is that part of us which really carries the record from one embodiment to another and so on. All embodiments in the flesh are, are actually necessary to the gradual unfoldment of the soul power. Therefore, in the presence of any emergency in this world, the soul carries the record of the most that we have ever learned in the great cycle of embodiments. All the learning of the, our past lives, all the wisdom we have gained, all the mellowing and fulfilling we have known, and all through our growth in nature is finally epitomized and summarized in the present state of the human soul. Therefore, the soul is wiser than the mind, the soul is far older than the body, and the soul alone provides us with this mysterious power of conscience by means of which we remember dimly what is wrong, although we may not have any detail. The soul convicts us when we betray it, or betray any other part of our natures, or any condition of life, or go contrary to the common good. Now, out of all of this, we come to another problem, and that is the city. There is a mysterious city, the great castle of the troubadours. There is the mysterious city, the utopias of uh, classical and later learning. There is this mysterious, better world that is supposed to lie beyond our mortal ken. Actually, the city of the troubadour, the castle of the virgin of the world, is this world that we live in now, which we must gradually transmute until the leadership and rulership of the world is transferred from the political and social problems that we know now to a reformed, regenerated, and redeemed social structure. In other words, soul must come of age not only in the individual but in his civilization. A soulless empire is as sick as a soulless person, and a world which is neglected soul will always be subject to disaster. That which has not 
corrected its own mistakes will perpetuate them. And wherever the, the immature become leaders of society, the social structure is endangered. So the perfect world that we would like to think of, the earthly paradise that is promised in the sacred and ancient writings, actually is a redeemed world, a world that has come down uh, to us and the new Jerusalem, which in a sense is termed the bride of the Lamb. The church was the bride of Christ. The soul, in a sense, is the actual bride of Christ. The city that has become ruled by the light of truth is therefore adorned as a bride. And in, that, in the city that is ruled by soul power, the divine power itself incarnates or becomes embodied in involving concepts of the return or the recoming of a great messiah or a great messianic savior. All these things are part of the victory of soul power over brute power, as that Mahatma Gandhi called it. And there never will be a solution to problem until this power of the inner good is given leadership over life. When man was fashioned, the soul potential as a seed, according to Bainley, was planted in his heart. These are also the Buddha seeds referred to in Buddhism. The soul is a seed originally, but if it is nursed and cared for, it grows into a beautiful plant, and this plant in turn becomes a great tree, and this tree bears many manner of fruit, and the fruit is for the healing of the nations. The soul tree, therefore, with its roots in the heart, becomes the shade under which we can all rest in peace, or the palm in the desert, in the oasis. And the soul is the private, personal oasis. And in the world, the soul is a civilization or culture that is founded upon the integrities of life. Now, we've never had a complete world that was founded upon such integrities. Many different nations have tried. Many peoples have attempted the effort. But in, in almost every instance, they have drifted away from the original purpose. This country was founded by persons deeply involved in the attainment of a nation with power of soul a world, a way of life, which was according to what the God of nature willed it to be. Gradually, however, the selfishness has cut out the power of the true directives upon which a nation must survive. Just as selfishness afflicts us as individuals, self-centeredness has afflicted the world politically, economically, and industrially. Therefore, the great dream of a better way of life has gradually become obscured. And as this becomes obscured, the result is devastating in terms of the survival of a civilization. Now in the case of a person who has a conscience, a soul within himself, and has as a human being the potential power of doing that which is right, a power to discern the difference between right and wrong, than the capacity to choose to be right. When this person fails to make this type of choice and drifts along with one compromise after another, we find little by little that the body, which is the physical institution in which the soul dwells, becomes corrupted. By degrees, the mistakes of the mind and the emotions begin to bear down upon the body. Little by little, they sicken it, corrupt it, disease it, until finally the body dies of the intemperances of that which dominates it, or leads it, or is involved within it. And where the mind or the uncultured emotions become intemperances, the body perishes. The same is true of a society. No nation that departs from the laws of integrity that allows the soul power to weaken than ever hope to be a success. Now, what are the soul power virtues in a person or in a collective? The soul power virtues in a person 
are, repre are represented by a kind of self-discipline in which the individual restrains and restricts destructive attitudes, in which he determines to do that which is closest to the common good. And the principal textbook for Western man on how this is to be accomplished is the Holy Bible. Here the individual learns what, it, what is expected of a person who claims to be truly religious. And uh, these simple rules and uh, attitudes and convictions become the basis of a morality for millions and hundreds of millions of human beings. It follows, however, that if these are ignored, if the religions that teach them are downgraded, if we are gradually taught to be ignorant, which is a trick if you can do it, and it's being done, we are being taught to be ignorant. We are being inspired to be stupid and believe that that is the answer to all the things we want. While this condition remains, we will never be able to take the leadership away from our appetites and re reaffirm these uh, values in terms of aspiration. So the thing is a culture goes becomes worse and worse. Our own relationships with life weaken. How are we going to help to restore this balance of power so that we can do something right? History tells us that usually the only way we can achieve this end is through disaster. Something must happen by means of which we suddenly dramatically realize that we have been terribly wrong. Something must happen so that our mistakes are too painful to continue. We must reach a point where we can't live with ourselves the way we are. As long as we can be reasonably comfortable and keep our faults, we will. But when our faults hurt so badly we cannot endure them, then we do something about them. It's the same way as a sick person who has aches and pains and neglects them, who is worn that care is necessary, pays no attention to it. When, however, a major ailment sets in, then the individual begins to listen and decides to do what he can to correct the situation if it's not too late. The same is true in society. Also, not only must we do these changes or make these changes in our own living, but we must gradually support these changes in collective society. We must try to move our way of life from a purely mental focus to a heart understanding. In, in uh, Asia, the Buddhist philosophy is called the heart doctrine. And the heart doctrine in the East has always been recognized as paramount. It has always been accepted that all mind and all mentation has as its primary purpose to find ways to fulfill the ideals of the heart. The heart is the true leader, not the mind. But where the heart is perverted or left unenlightened, it can be troublesome also. But an undeveloped heart in an undeveloped mind is an impossible combination and is bound to produce trouble. So in uh, Dante's uh, understanding of this mysticism, the secret allegiance of the human being to the way of his own heart, an allegiance he tells to no one. He tells no one who his true love is. He would never in any way desecrate the object of his affection by associating himself with it. He knows that he is imperfect and he is not going to damage the reputation of truth by claiming to possess it and then not live it. So in silence, in complete absence of personal acclaim or recognition, he quietly venerates truth, lives with it, assumes it to be the great love of his life, cherishes it, protects it, but is silent, only showing it by his attitude in various respects but never proclaiming his true devotion. 
He doesn't tell other people that he is in love with truth. Because if he does and makes a few bad mistakes, people will say truth is wrong. He is not going to disfigure the reality by claiming to possess it, but he is going to glorify it by continuing to serve it day and night, life after life, until through complete uh, submission to the divine plan and the divine purpose, by accepting humbly the wisdom of God and the love of God, he is prepared for the next step in the great development of human life and human purpose. So Dante takes this attitude very, very clearly. He is also involved with another interesting factor, and that is that Amor, or Cupid, as it was known in the Greek mythology, who is more or less the deity presiding over love, is male, not female. But Cupid is God as love. In other words, Cupid becomes the divine attribute of love. God, the attribute of love as it is in the divine nature, pure, uncontaminated, and undefiled. It is the divine power as love. And as love, it is the source of all the messianic saviors. Love as the redeeming power within the nature of deity itself. Therefore, in a sense, love is the second aspect of deity. It is also the only begotten of the Father. Love, therefore, enters into the life of Dante as a mysterious being. And this mysterious being is the one that guides him and guards him in his relationships with Beatrice. It, uh, Beatrice becomes, therefore, the symbol or the embodiment of the vision the true love as the God power has bestowed upon Dante. In other words, love in its perfect nature has made it possible for him to love something. And this love of something or someone is made possible because God is love. And therefore, it is not a, an, an, an accidental thing. Love is not dependent upon the human being for its survival. It is part of the divine nature. Worlds come and go. Continents rise and fall. Even space itself is ch constantly changing its complexion. But the supreme power governing all things governs with love and wisdom. And this love is the eternal rightness of things, which Dante gradually comes to understand. And it is this love which is God, which he is able to manifest through himself in his love for Beatrice. Beatrice, therefore, signifies the proper object of divine love. It represents the symbol of the purpose of love. The purpose of love is to bestow. Love is not something that locks itself within itself and stays there. It must manifest. And the divine love, which is placed in the human heart, manifests through love of something. Love of peace, love of good, love of virtue, love of friend, love of family. The love principle becomes the basis of the growth of the soul power in the person. Therefore, this character appears and floats through Dante's book always bearing witness to the fact that it is because love exists that the human being can love. It is because love is the strong, one of the strongest laws in the universe that it becomes the criterion of all accomplishment. If it was not that love is eternal, all things of themselves would be exhausted in their efforts to develop integrities and values. Love is not mental primarily, nor is it amental. It is not against the mind, but love expresses through the regenerated mind. It recognizes 
the regenerated emotions, and in a strange way, in nature itself, in natural processes, the eternal love operates in the maintenance of the human body also. Love is the thing by means of which all motivation is brought about, motivation to return to God. And that which is against this motivation is against God. Now man being a frail creature and imperfect in all his parts is unable sometimes to handle the mystery of love. It becomes too complicated for him. He mixes it up with passion or lust or greed. He well loves worldliness, which in itself is an anachronism. But he has within himself the capacity for the true ideal affection which is represented in Dante's book. Dante experienced it in himself as a mystical experience. He found it not in the world but in himself. It was in his dreams that the perfect devotion was revealed. It was in dreams beyond this world that that which must come to this world first appeared. Therefore, in Dante's idea, or ideal, the eternal beauty, which we must ultimately cultivate, is first available only as a mystical experience within ourselves. The beginning of true love is a mystical experience within the person. It is something which can be experienced only in vision, in some strange emergency, in a great tragedy or disaster in which the person has to retire into himself to gain the strength of survival. Therefore, the true affection is a kind of archetypal thing found first in dreams. But from the dream it is gradually transmitted into a more tangible form. But this mysterious love is forever limited or localized to an inward experience. It is something that happens inside. It cannot be clearly communicated in words. It cannot be demonstrated alone by action. Though to understand it or to accept it, you must meet it on its own level. And this the average person cannot do. The person may be grateful for the kindness of another, but this gratitude may not in any sense touch the core of himself in which he would find the kinship of two, true minds or true hearts. So to us, the things we try to do nicely are simply episodes, they're incidents, they're natural tendencies. It is natural for parents to love their children. It is natural for us to be kind to our friends. But it is also, unfortunately, too natural to us to be unkind to our enemies. And in this state of affairs, we prove that we do not understand the deeper meaning of the ideals of that we even find in the Sermon on the Mount. Do good to those that despitefully use you. This is a statement from the soul, but very few people are willing to justify it by backing it up mentally or physically. It remains a beautiful abstraction. We have not recognized it yet as an absolute necessity. Out of the whole concept, then, there is a maturing of life. And this maturing of life is gradually a transformation by which we ascend from our present objective focus to a way of leadership in which we become the servants of the divine love of God, in which everything that comes through us is already completely transformed so that every action is an extension of the divine power through our own lives. It is gradually becoming possible for us to be, be led by the soul in the ways of righteousness. It is possible for us to shift from the selfishness that we now nourish to the divine plan for which we were intended. And the key to this is our power to express devotion, dedication. And the emotion that leads to this, the only acceptable emotion in nature, is the emotion 
of the love of man for the divine, and that this love for the divine, by natural extension, extends into all things that are fashioned by the divine. Therefore, to love God is to love all creation and all creatures, including the enemies. It is part of our possibility, then, to build a world around conscience, around soul extension and soul power, a world that shall sometime find the answers which it is seeking today. We are gravely worried at the moment because of the dangers of a nuclear holocaust or a danger of the pollution of our world. All such infirmities and miseries have their origin in human selfishness. These are not the manifestations of the love of one human being for another or the love of any human being for God. These are manifestations of self-interest. They are the power that has resulted, as uh, we learn in St. Augustine, in transforming the city of God into the city of death. We have transformed heaven into a Babylon. And that which was intended to be a beautiful place where we could grow together in righteousness has been corrupted by our own selfishness. And selfishness is both mental and emotional. Mental is the incentive. Mental is the justification. Mental is the conspiracy of working out how to attain these ends. But emotion is also the appetites by means of which we justify the conspiracies of the mind. We say to ourselves, I want this. This is emotional. Therefore, we say, in this way I can get it, and that is mental. And in this problem of decision, we are very seldom strictly ethical. We make compromises of all kinds to justify our own purposes. So we have to overcome this in one way or another, either have, have change forced upon us or make the change by the strength of character within ourselves. Dante's idea is very simple on this matter. Truth is something very beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing imaginable. Just exactly what it is and how to define it is not really very easy to say. Uh, but Dante defines it as the absolute object of all human search. He defines it, therefore, in the most perfect form that he can imagine it, and that is the form of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin of the world, the perfect virtue, the perfect good, the eternal mother, that which is forever provident, that which is forever meditating upon the well-being of its offspring everywhere, the protectress, the enlightener, the leader of the whole program of redemption in which it is the love of the great mother that would make the world safe for all her children. So Dante takes this symbol under the name of Beatrice, which was not incidentally the actual name of the young lady who was supposed to be involved. But Beatrice was good because it goes with beatitude and all the terms that have to do with grace. But in uh, this case, he has created an image like a, a, a very um, wonderful mandala, a, a sacred symbol to represent the eternal mother of life as manifested through this beautiful person in whom all the virtues of life he feels are personified. Therefore, he adores this. He worships it. He grieves over it. He grieves after having it, being deprived of it. But finally, when Beatrice in his vision, the perfect symbol in his vision, dies, he is not as disconsolate as might be seemed, because she is the soul. And if the soul dies, he feels that when the time comes, he will go forth and join her. And that together, as in the divine comedy, they will advance to paradise or to the heavenly regions because she, as love, will lead him there. He cannot go alone. This type of symbolism has so many amplifications and so many ramifications, weeks, months can be spent in trying to interpret all of its mystery. 
But it tells us as for another thing, for example, that Dante realizes that within his own masculine body is a feminine soul, that he is in a strange way an androgen already, that the, that the woman in him is there, and that that represents the best part of himself, and that therefore in obeying the feminine or anima of his own nature he is fulfilling the divine plan, because it is this which will lead him. All that is worthwhile will come from his own soul, from that which is the inner part of his own life. And if he is led by the inner part, he will go in glory. If he is led by the outer part, he will suffer uh, through ages of vicissitudes. So all of these elements have their own little sense and line, and occasionally, and quite regularly, in fact, in the uh, Vita Nova, he writes a little sonnet or a little love poem to this mysterious lady. He also writes some music to her. He is forever honoring her, wishing her all joy and peace. But he never sends her the poems. No, that wouldn't be proper. He simply keeps them. Uh, he has expressed his devotion, but he never sends the letter to the Beatrice. Rather, he has discovered that in the poem or in the sonnet, which he has written with his mind, he is actually paying tribute to his own soul. That the mind has written its poem, the hand has traced the letters, but the soul alone knows what it means and that this secret meaning is life, his daily actions. He does not fully understand. He never would possibly write them and pass on the information. But the action which he makes, the dedicated effort that he is constantly engaged in of venerating, worshiping, and respecting his own soul, the soul itself will know. It doesn't have to be told. He does not have to receive the message, because it, the message is written out of its own content, out of the soul's own appreciation of things. So Dante has a little private world of his own, which he lived in and in which he died, a world in which his entire life, or the most of it at least, was devoted to the strange mystical inner experiences which he passed through along the way experiences which taught him uh, that somewhere inside of himself was the virgin of the world, worthy of all respect, and somewhere in space was the mother of mysteries, and that this whole great pageantry of love is an eternal mother principle manifesting through a world created for the purpose of sharing in the beauties and graces of heavenly insight, that the whole world is a great family, and that the fatherhood of God and the motherhood of God are one thing. The wisdom and love rule all things, and if man will obey these principles and rescue the feelings, the emotions of them from within himself, he will be so busy worshiping the beautiful and recognizing the good that he will have little time for complaint or for any of the negative attitudes and doubts and fears. Dante, Dante had his doubts and his fears, but he took them to the eternal feminine, and she brought him peace. We take our problems to the soul within us. If it understands and we permit, it will bring us peace. And it also gradually will bring the world peace and make possible a world for those who come after us that is far better than anything we have ever known. I think it's a, a very interesting point of view as expressed in the story of the new life, the life of love in a world of uncertainties. Well, friends, I guess that's all for this morning.